Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. I promise you joy in the mystery. Dr. Marissa, also known as the Asian Oprah. Her mission, to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, laugh, love, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Pay. And... Welcome. You are tuned in to my weekly talk radio show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Tuesday at naturally high noon out of the Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood, California and Universal Broadcasting Network. And then on Thursdays and Saturdays on my syndicated CNBC News radio channel, KCAA AM 1050 and now FM 106.3 and 106.5. And this is a show about hope and happiness. So even though Scandal is broadcast here and made here at the studios, there will be no Scandal talking, no gossip, and no K-words at all, no Kardashian talk. In fact, there's no CNN constantly negative news because I want to highlight what is good with the world and what is good with you. In fact, I want you to focus on your reality show and how you can be happy 88% of the time. And happy Groundhog Day. Yes, spring is here. And happy Chinese New Year of the Red Fire Monkey. That will be on Monday in my heritage. And it will be about finances. So blessings of prosperity to all who are listening now. And it is my 200th show on the air. Woohoo! <laughs> um, little applause, thank you. <laughs> Patting myself on the back here. So grateful to have had the wonderful life adventure of having this on the air. And uh, one of my guests today also called in on my 100th show. So I'm following that tradition of bringing on the best when I get to celebrate. And it's also celebrating the 19th annual season uh, for nonviolence, which is, uh, uh, um, uh, was a 60, is a 64-day campaign co-founded in 1998 by Dr. Arun Gandhi and the Association for Global New Thought, again, one of my guests co-founded, and occurs between the memorial anniversaries of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi, January 30th to April 4th. So to celebrate that, I couldn't think of three more powerful teachers that have blessed my life. Some of them know, know it more than others. Uh, but uh, they, I can't wait to introduce you to these three amazing men on my panel. Neil Donald Walsh is a modern day spiritual messenger whose groundbreaking book, Conversations with God, was on the bestseller list for two and, over two and a half years. And his continued series has been translated into 37 languages to touch millions Millions of lives with love, inspiration, and hope. Bishop Carlton Pearson, who's been on 2020 Nightline, CBS, and more, is an evangelist who expanded out of the Church of Exclusion to preach the gospel of inclusion. His latest book, published by Simon Schuster, is called God is Not a Christian, Not a Jew, Muslim, Hindu, dot, dot, dot. God dwells with with us, in us, around us, as us. And I was happy to have him on as a guest last year. And then, last but not least, Michael Bernard Beckwith, affectionately known as The Reb, The Rev, and my big brother, has been on Dr. Oz, The Oprah Winfrey Show, Larry King Live, and more, and is the founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center, a trans-denominational movement and community of 9,000 local members and a million friends worldwide, where I get my positive roots watered. One of the co-founders for the Seasons of Nonviolence. You may remember him congratulating me on my 100th show. And he actually said, I'm not just the Asian Oprah, that Oprah was going to start calling herself the black Dr. Marissa, which, <laughs> <laughs> which was very funny. And I do remember. Please, a super, super duper warm welcome to my powerful panel to celebrate my 200th show on the air. <laughs> I 
I am so honored and grateful, and I'm going to start with the following. Um, in one word, how would you best describe who you are? In one word, how would you best describe who you are? Because I know you're friends, and we're going to do something fun after that. So starting with yourself, how, one word that would best describe who you are. Let's start with, uh, let's start with uh, Carlton. Curious. Curious. Michael? Uh, servant. Neil? Divinity. Divinity. Beautiful. Mm. Now, one word that you would use to best describe your friends on the air with you right now. So let's start with uh, Mike, uh, Reverend Michael. Who, or what is one word that you would use to describe Neil and Carlton? Uh, Carlton is uh, inspirational, mm. and Neil is devotional. Mm. And uh, Neil? Well, I, I'm sorry to be so predictable, but I'm going to say divinity for both of them because when I look into their eyes and when I experience their presence and when I am imbued by who they are, I simply see divinity. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you. And Thank you. Carlton? Well, I'll use this, the, the, the words I've used for them individually. I'm going to use for both of them twice. Once, the bottom line is love from both of them. Incredibly men of love, uh, unconditional love that has so embraced the world and enlightened. Mm -hmm. They're so illuminated and illuminating uh, until I have to wear shades to be around them. They're just that <laughs> bright. That is that is beautiful, and I would I would say all three of you are beautiful, beautiful souls, and I I thank you so much for the contribution that each one of you has made to my life, and I would say that you. Um, uh, I would say Reverend Michael is uh, fabulous, that uh, Carlton is amazing, and that Neil is divine. <laughs> How is that? <laughs> okay, and I get one word, but you can do it later. All right. <laughs> Actually, no, one word for me, just because it's my show. Neil, Neil, Neil. Energizing. 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 Okay, bunny. I like that. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say... Um, Enthused. Yeah. Okay. God breathe. With God. Yes. I like that. Thank you. Neil, you don't really know me, but Divinity. I know oh. you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank Neil's you. got the one word going on. He does. He does. <laughs> All right. I love if it. You, and if you've just tuned in and wondering who I'm talking to, this is a fabulous panel of wonderful teachers. And I'm actually going to drop the G-bomb right now because we're going to talk about God on this show today. So if you're not, um, some people will say, oh, my God, Dr. Marissa is going religious. No. Uh, I am not religious at all. In, in fact, I'm allergic to religion. Uh, I love that saying, though, that religion is for people who want to avoid going to hell, and spirituality is for those of us who've already been there. So yeah. this will be a spiritual show, because we're going to talk about and put the moose on the table about some of those things that people don't like to talk about, religion, politics. We're doing religion today, but spirituality in particular. And I'm going to start off with who and what is God to you? and ask each one of you to answer that question. Who or what is God to you? And let's start, let's start with Neil. I'm sorry, would you ask me the question again? Sure, who is God to you or what is God to you? Uh, I, I, I'm going to answer it in an unusual way. I'm gonna answer it in a reverse way if you allow me to. Absolutely. I don't, I don't, I don't try to define or describe or, or explain who God is to me. Uh, the question really is who is God not? And my answer to that is nothing. So if I accept that God is not nothing, that, that is nothing that is not God, mm -hmm. then who God is to me is everything that is, ever was, and ever will be. Mm -hmm. That there's no separation between what I understand God to be, my, my experience and my expression of divinity, and all that divinity has expressed. So who is God? Everything. 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 Rev. I'll embrace everything that uh, Neil just said. Everything that is is a manifestation of the only thing that is, which is the presence. And I describe the presence. I mean, you, you really can't describe something that's indescribable, but the best way is um, God is a presence that's not an absence. So this presence is everywhere, and this presence is not just in all creation. All creation is in the presence. 
because the presence is infinite, omni, everywhere, and uh, carries the vibration of all of the sacred qualities that we would speak about, the non-dual quality of love and harmony and peace and intelligence and beauty and all of those wonderful qualities, and conscious, alive, awake. Mm. So that's a, a, a beginning of, of a presence that's never an absence. Beautiful. Carlton? Well, you said who who is God and what is God to me, so that that's a little bit limiting. The generic God is the Father's reaches and rhythms and re, uh, regions of consciousness that would be God. But to me, God would be the deepest, broadest, most imminent experience of myself, um, my divinity, my divine expression and essence uh, would be what God is to me. Mm -hmm. And again, what the gentlemen have already said, my friends, as well as that farthest, deepest reach or rhythm. Uh -huh. The limitless. Yeah, of yeah. consciousness. Yeah. Well, the thing that strikes me and why I wanted all three of you that I love so much is your personal relationships with God. You, the, 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 the way that you live, breathe, and, and express as God is what, how you have helped so many people, uh, that personal relationship. So... So, so in that vein, a little odd question, do you ever get mad at God? <laughs> Who's going first? Who's... I don't know. You go. <laughs> I keep forgetting there's three of you here. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I can't say that I ever get mad at God. Okay. I, I, that's not a part of my experience. Um, you know, when, when, we, when I consider the presence, as soon as you ask the question, my eyes want to close. And like Carlton, I just want to like revel in this deep sense of, of connection, of, of the presence that is, is so close, closer to me than I am to myself. And so if I get mad, it's not really at God. It's really at myself, at my own misperception, mm -hmm. um, uh, my misalignment. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, at this stage of, of my development over 40 years of, of meditating and praying and studying, I can't say that I get mad at God, mm -hmm. but I might uh, be mad at myself for misalignment from time to time. Well, I, I asked this question specifically uh, for two reasons. One, because uh, I read or listened to your interview with Larry King Live, Neil, and you said the first time that you had um, that conscious talk to from God was when you were almost threatening and saying, you know, if you are real, show yourself and, and, you know, what are the answers? And so that's part of the question. And then the other part of the question, the reason why I'm asking it is there's many people out there and, and my listeners too, when I said you were coming on, I had, uh, lots of reactions. And one of them was, you know, uh, if there's a God, and God is supposed to be love, then why is all of this horrific stuff happening around the world today with ISIS, uh, with terrorism, uh, yesterday with the Holocaust, with starving children, with, um, you know, my sister dying in a, in a freak flood, uh, all of, the, if God is, you know, all that you're saying it is, how can he let that happen? Neil. Uh, you're asking uh, a question that is uh, unanswerable with a little 30 second sound bite. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> That's a huge, okay. huge question. Okay, so that, mean, me so, so, so that means we can have a whole day workshop on the air? <laughs> you know, if you want to give me the rest of the hour, uh, I'll be able to answer that question thoroughly. Uh, but um, in, in brief, I would seek to answer it. Uh, by saying, with regard to the actions of others, uh, ISIS and the things you brought up, as opposed to uh, as opposed to accidents like somebody dying in a car accident or tornadoes, and let's just limit it for the for the for this moment to the actions of others. The human beings on the earth are behaving, in my view, this is my understanding, are behaving the way they are behaving because they simply don't know who they really are. They have no idea why, they, where they really are. 
They have no idea why they are where they really are, and therefore they don't know what to do about that. Mm -hmm. We're a very young species, extremely young species, relative to the age of the Earth. We're about 30 seconds old in in terms of cosmic time, really less than that, Mm -hmm. half of a second Mm -hmm. old, really, Mm -hmm. in terms of cosmic time. We're a very young species. Anthropologists know this. So given the the very um, primitive nature of who we are, it's understandable that we are behaving like children. So uh, the question is not why are we behaving the way we are, why is what's happening happening in terms of human-caused events, but what could be done to shift and change our perception of ourselves and our understanding of who we are and why we're here. Mm -hmm. With regard to the the larger events, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the the so-called natural occurrences, again, a surprising number, a high percentage of those so-called natural occurrences have been created by human beings, you know, exploding, blowing up bombs under the earth and, and creating, and then we wonder why there, why there are earthquakes, and we wonder uh, w- why there's global warming, and we wonder why nature is behaving, if you please, the way it is, why it's rebelling in a sense, uh, the, the way it is. But, but of course, 98% of nature's responses to life on this planet are caused by human beings as well, as I observe it, as I understand it. Mm-hmm. With regard to the third part of your see, you asked a very complex question. With regard to the third part of your question, the accidents that happen, the piano that falls on us, you know, from the from the, the proverbial piano mm-hmm. falling from the apartment building up there, or not to make light of it, the sad tragedies of people dying in accidents and so forth. I want to say there's more going on here than meets the eye. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I want to say that no one dies or is injured or experiences anything in life at a time or in a way that is not of their choosing. Mm. And I've, mm. been, I've, been, I've been informed of that very directly. But when I try to wrap my head around that, how that can be true and how that functions, I have to, re, I have to just retreat to my friend Bill Shakespeare, who simply put it in one beautiful sentence, there are more things in heaven and earth ratio that are dreamt of in your philosophy. Mm. Mm. Great. Uh, Carlton? Um, I think we are all human gods that are abstract and interpolations of the divine perfection. And there's a passage in the, in the sacred text, the Jewish sacred text, the Old Testament, where it says, now they have become like us, knowing good and evil. Uh, the knowledge, or da'ath in Hebrew, the experimentation or the experience of the true or tree the truth of good and evil has become such a part of our dual expressions, and there is a good and an evil expression of divinity uh, that may not be interpreted as evil in the divine, but by humans who are divine, uh, trying to bridge humanity to divinity. There is a, a, a there's an inner there's a place between the dots mm-hmm. <laughs> that is op, is an obscure and abstract and and uh, contorted. If everything that God made is good and everything that is made is God, then what would what would what would evil be but a, some kind of abstraction Absolutely. of good, mm-hmm. some distortion of good? So, all of the the so called evil on the planet, I agree with Neil. We have created it either in collective consciousness or or individual consciousness because we become what we what we create and we create what we think most about. So, so that's we- the frequency that we tune into. We have the power as little gods to create evil. So don't blame God for what we have contributed to creating. Blame, if you're going to blame, blame the God that we are, Mm -hmm. which is an imperfect one, an imprecise one. We're all trying to find our maturity Mm -hmm. as divine entities. But we we are incarcerated or incarnated in these fleshly traps that we call bodies. So it is, it is a challenge. I, the, the, the thing that I learned uh, from from Reverend Michael that was so important was that I could choose to believe a God that was not the God that I grew up with, which was a fundamental Baptist, sorry, um, which they say is a precursor to agnosticism or atheism or a God that needs anger management classes. Yeah. And I think for many, what I'm just loving right. seeing at right. Agape... Right. Sorry, go ahead, Neil. Try growing up Catholic. I'm sorry, I couldn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have a we're gonna have a war on uh, pre pre atheism uh, schools of thought, but uh, but um, no Pentecost in there. Then you really got a challenge. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and the the choice to to choose, and I call my God my UPS man, my universal power source, who delivers every morning when I pray and meditate on the beach, and it's wonderful because all day I'll see the trucks go by and like, oh, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> but Rev, you were you were you were vehemently agreeing with Neil at one point when he was oh, talking oh, about absolutely. It. He's really you know speaking for all of us. I mean we're. As a, as, a, as a spiritual beings having a human incarnation, we are unfolding and evolving. And uh, there are individuals who are out of touch with who and what they are, why they exist. And uh, they'll have a tendency to think and speak and act uh, from a sense of destruction, seeing themselves separate from other people, separate from the environment. Mm -hmm. And there are beings who have a greater degree of awareness as to who and what they are, and their thoughts and speech or actions more create beauty and love and artistry and, and creativity. Mm -hmm. And all of those stages and states of consciousness are all on the planet at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you, you could have a being on the planet right now that is so in love with the presence and creating tremendous beauty and generosity and philanthropy, and you have beings on the planet that are so disconnected that they are living under the frequency of greed and avarice and separation and racism and bigotry and things of that particular nature. Their egoic structure has created such a small world for themselves that they act destructively. Mm -hmm. But none of that has anything to do with the presence of God, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That has something to do with our connection or disconnection with the presence. When you speak of ISIS and things of this particular nature and people like that, uh, you're talking about individuals who have um, distorted religion and restored the teachings and are disconnected and are very immature. And they're also in the minority of people on the planet. They just get bigger press mm -hmm. because we have a tendency to focus on that frequency of destruction. And, and the lowest common denominator of the human experience is what we is what uh, corporate media focuses on. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, there's somebody having spontaneous remission. There are people doing tremendous acts of goodwill, tremendous acts of philanthropy. And it's, you're not going to read about it. You're not right. going to uh, understand that. But consider for a moment if we were brought up in a society that every day you turn on the news and for the whole hour you received uh, this many people got spontaneous remissions, this many people generated money f financially for school systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera our consciousness would be different. We begin yes. to anticipate and expect something higher in our life rather than defend ourselves against the next negative thing that's about to happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I embrace exactly what uh, Neil and, and Carlton are, are saying. Yeah, I've, I love the way you call media the weapon of mass distraction. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and that's why I wanted to do this show because I really, really wanted to highlight the good and bring people on like you to sort of balance out all of that CNN. Neil. I'd like to offer kind of a revolutionary idea, revolutionary in the sense that not many people are saying it out loud, but what I was told in conversations with God, and it relates directly to your question about ISIS, and for that matter, anybody doing anything really, especially those things that we label as negative or not okay. I was told in conversations with God, consider the possibility that every act is an act of love, every act is an act of love. Every action undertaken by any human being from the beginning of time until this very moment is an act of love. The thief steals because he loves something and imagines the only way he can get what he loves is by stealing it. The killer kills because he is it, it, uh, coming from a principle of loving something so much that he thinks he has to kill another in order to defend what it is he loves. The problem is not that people are acting out of love. The problem is that they do not, under, do not understand the, the essence of love and how to express it fully. Carlton touched on this a minute ago when he talked about the distortion, the distortion of love. But every act is an act of love, and that's what makes all acts understandable. Mm. And you, you see, mm. understanding even terrorism? Even terrorism. Even terrorism. Understand, Sorry. Understanding, re, understanding replaces forgiveness in the mind of the master. This is why God doesn't have to forgive anybody. God doesn't even have to forgive those who would perpetrate the actions to which you are referring now, whether it's in the Middle East or anywhere else. See, God has no need to forgive any one of us. God understands us. 
even as we understand the two-year-old child who spoils the birthday party by spilling the milk all over the party table. Mm-hmm. So we don't say to that mm-hmm. two-year-old child, go to your room for the rest of your life, because we understand that the child spilled the milk reaching for the chocolate cake that she loves so well and simply didn't consider the consequences of her actions. Mm -hmm. But her actions were born in a deep and reverent love for something or another, and she simply didn't know how to express it appropriately. Mm -hmm. Our opportunity then as human beings is to demonstrate how to express love appropriately. And by the way, if you want that kind of a demonstration, look at the other two faces on the screen right now because that's who Michael and Carlson are living demonstrations of how to express love appropriately yes all three of you are all three of you are and speaking of which you help so many people all three of you help so many people do you ever get tired do you ever get tired and if you get tired what do you say to yourself or do it, during those times when you you don't maybe I don't know do you ever not feel like teaching or do you ever not feel like um, inspiring or motivating maybe not uh, let's <laughs> that, let let's start with uh, Rev uh, two things one I want to piggyback on what uh, Neil just said um, for I often tell people that behind every human aberration there lies a spiritual aspiration. So embracing what he's saying about every act being an act of love, behind what appears to be aberrant, there's an aspiration of love or of peace or of some quality trying to express itself, but it's just coming out aberrantly based on a a level of ignorance. So I I, I embrace everything that he said and and really appreciate it. And and of course the body gets tired. Of course, uh, I I think that um, rest is is not a bad word. It's not a bad four-letter word. And... um, (laughs) One of these days, I'm going to try it. <laughs> but uh, no, there there are moments uh, where there's definitely a, a need more rest, mentally and physically. And uh, but but I I do have access to an energy that carries me through until I can get to the rest period, mm-hmm. um, which I think I'm I'm very humble, very privileged about that that I that I can tap in, and uh, and in moments of almost exhaustion physically. I can still go to a place within myself and be carried by the presence. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I love that that occurs. But yeah, I, I, I got a physical body. I'm going to get tired. I have a mental body. It's going to get tired. Mm-hmm. And, and um, there's, there's no denying that. Okay. Carlton? Um, I want to piggyback on what both of them <laughs> just said in Sports. reference to, to ISIS, uh, because this is an important point. Mm-hmm. Terrorists are terrorists because they're terrorized. Mm-hmm. They are inwardly afraid that they're not going to get something they think is theirs, whether that's ISIS or somebody who robs a bank or somebody who rapes somebody, feeling like they're alienated, isolated, or that they are experiencing the illusion of lack. Every soul knows it's okay, but the soul doesn't always believe it or the mind doesn't believe what the soul knows. A person who robs a bank knows they should have financial security, but they don't believe it, so they steal. A person who uses drugs, abuses drugs, is because they know they are at peace, but they don't believe it. Hmm. So uh, a belief and knowledge are in conflict in the universe right now. Everybody knows they're loved. Everybody's soul and cell knows they're okay, but their minds have been taught and told something differently, and yet their soul has experienced something other than that. And do I get tired of trying to get that over? (laughs) Scripture (laughs) says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you don't faint. Well, sometimes (laughs) I faint, and so, but the reason I kick back in is because I want to (laughs) reap what I've sown in love. Uh, we do get weary, yes. We do get drawn, and Jesus um, even slept and rested. He was on a boat in the middle of a storm. He knew how to sleep in a storm. So I'm trying to learn how Jesus could sleep through his storm and find rest when everybody else was freaked out. Uh, I'm learning that, and it's. Uh, but I'm 62 years old, and the scripture says, "He giveth his beloved sleep." So, <laughs> well, you look like you use oil of Olay. So that. <laughs> Or the old of oil of old ladies, I used to say. <laughs> Neil, you want to wrap this before we go to break? How do you how do well, you rest? Uh, infrequently, 
uh, like Michael and Carlton, I'm sure I don't I don't rest a lot, but I I, I do like any like you know like they said. Of course, I, and there are days when I'm utterly exhausted, where I'm going from one minute to the next, mm -hmm. something from ten to mm -hmm. eleven, something from eleven to twelve, something from twelve to one, and I turn to my staff and I say, "My God, literally, what you know? What where do I have a chance to use the restroom? What can somebody hand me a sandwich?" And and, and there are days like that, many of them like that, in the lives of all of us, I know. But when I find myself doing uh, something that I call resting, when I find myself doing something that's off purpose for me in my life, uh, you ask, how, what do we ask ourselves or how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. Here's how I deal with it. I have a fundamental question that I ask myself. And again, this is a question that, forgive me, I was given in conversations with God. God invited me to ask the following question in any moment of my life. And here it comes. This is what I call the magic question. Okay. Whenever I'm okay. doing anything, thinking anything, or having anything uh, 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 move through me, I ask the following question. And what does this have to do with the agenda of my soul? Mm. Mm. Love that. Mm. Love that. Wow. 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 And with that, we're going to have to go to break to ponder that one. That was fabulous. And uh, I do need to thank the sponsors that make these shows possible my fabulous panel you are listening to take my advice i'm not using it get balanced with dr marissa with my powerful panel neil donald walsh uh, michael bernard beckwith and carlton pearson we'll be right back in two and two peace in and peace out our sponsor for today's show is lisa rochelle Cohen, your InSparkle compassion hostess, coach, and inspired author of Grace is Born and My Grace is Born Companion, the perfect gift for sages of all ages, wearing the face of every race, talking the tongue of everyone. Grace is Born and My Grace is Born Companion are beautifully illustrated by Judith Joseph, an internationally celebrated visionary artist whose images dance with divinity. You can schedule your next InSparkle Compassion event and order your books today at InSparkleMedia.com. And we are back. And uh, just so you three gentlemen know, Lisa was adamant that she really, really wanted to uh, sponsor this particular episode. So thank you, Lisa. And uh, we're back with a question that was asked by one of the listeners. Actually, there's two of them. One is, what is the secret of to happiness? And the Dalai Lama actually said, um, if I tell you, then it won't be a secret anymore. <laughs> and, the, and then the second question is, um, uh, what is the meaning of life? So either or both, you know, just really little questions that I know we only have. Like, I'm sure you can, you know, you're so brilliant. You can synopsize into two minutes the answer to those two questions. <laughs> I know I'm too much. So let's start with uh, let's start with Carlton this time. Which was the, what was the first one? Uh, the first one is what's the secret to happiness, and what's the meaning of life? I couldn't decide uh, which one to do, so I'm doing both. The word "secret" is where we get the word "sacred." So I I I would hear that question as what is what is sacred about happiness, or what is sacred happiness? Ha, uh, happy happiness. Happiness comes from what's happening. So there is a secret or sacredness beyond what's happening, and I call that joy. It's all internal. Um, I like the way Wayne Dyer says that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So perception is the ultimate reality, but not necessarily the ultimate truth. <clears throat> Changing the perception will determine how it affects you on a cellular and cellular level. So happiness is not, again, just about things that are happening externally, but what is occurring internally inside you. And I'm still at 62 years old, uh, divining that, if you will, mm -hmm. every day, because every day a different circumstance appears. And I go within and say, okay, how am I going to assess this? Am I going to make it my enemy or my friend? I did that when I experienced cancer. I did not allow cancer to kill me. I only allowed it to teach me. Mm -hmm. I said, you come here with a mission, teach me what you're going to teach me and get on down the road. I've been cancer free for almost 10 years. So that's uh, awesome. That's how I, manipulated it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Rev? When we consider happiness, we cons it's, it's intrinsic to us. Uh, joy and happiness are 
a dimension of our, our real nature, of our, our real being that we're uncovering through the shifting of our perception and through putting ourselves in a position to have insight and revelation. And so that which brings it about is, I would say, gratitude. Mm -hmm. That as we begin to really lift our awareness and become grateful as a practice, mm -hmm. thankful and appreciative, then more happiness follows. As I have said from time to time, you know, our parents would say to us growing up, uh, you know, if you keep crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. <laughs> <laughs> what the universe says, if you keep being grateful, I'm going to give you something to be grateful about. Whoa, mm. I love so, that. so when you open yourselves up to gratitude, then the universe provides uh, conditions and circumstances for you to be happy. But ultimately, that happiness and joy is not based on circumstances at all. Right. It's, it's an ever-increasing awareness of your intrinsic nature. Yes. And I would say a quick approach to that is to up-level your gratitude. Mm-hmm. Great. Yes. Are you happy right now? Yes. I can tell. <laughs> All three of you. I'm thrilled. And it's not you. based on any condition. I can give you 20 conditions right. that I don't like. Mm -hmm. But you're right. still happy. happy. But, but, but uh, I'm still happy. Yeah. Yeah. That you've, you've taught me that, and I am grateful for that. Neil, are you happy? Well, first of all, i got to tell you how difficult it is to follow these two gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. <thank> you! You! <laughs> Yeah, please. I have, I have to say this, you know, I was talking to Michael on the phone just three minutes before we came on the air here, and he was crying. He was weeping. And I said, Michael, are you okay? He said, well, I am, but I'm a little nervous. There are 200 show and a global audience, and I just, I just really am nervous. I don't know what to say. And I, so I gave him my speech. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, oh, just, God, love just, me. <laughs> uh, let me. Let me, the secret to have for me is in one sentence. I've been asked this question before and I've given the same answer everywhere I'm asked it. What's the secret of happiness? Not requiring it. Mm. How, can, how can you not require it? By observing, now here we go with Michael said, by observing that you already have it, that you are it. Mm -hmm. That you need mm -hmm. nothing to be happy except to stop denying mm -hmm. who you are mm -hmm. is really so. But the secret to happiness for me in one word is to not require it. And as to the meaning of life, nothing has any meaning save the meaning you give it. Mm. So I've mm. discovered in my life that my life means what I choose for it to mean, what I call for it to mean, and what I require it to mean to me. And I can tell you right now that the meaning that I have given my life has manifested in my life directly out of my willingness to give it meaning. Life is not a process of discovery. Life is a process of creation. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm in gratitude to your book was very instrumental when I read it to to answer that question for me. What is the meaning of life? It is a meaningful life. And when I read the answers to the questions that you got, it really um, things started to click, 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 click. And then I had my personal uh, experience at Agape, the very first time at Agape. I hadn't even seen Reverend Michael on stage and and I felt, you know, I wasn't a meditator, but I literally felt a presence come up and put his arm. He it looked like um, Batman, you know, on Hollywood Boulevard with those big black wings and the big high platforms. And it, I literally heard a voice. I don't know if I've told you this, big brother, but I literally heard a voice tap me on the shoulder and said, darling, you can church shop because I've been church shopping. You can church shop from now until eternity and have fun with it. But know that I've always been here behind you waiting for you to turn around and dance with me mm, and and i started crying and crying and crying and then you got on stage and you started talking about peace love joy harmony i'm like whoa let me write this down <laughs> that was just life-changing life-changing the, the title of your next book that's the title of your next book oh, oh. there's the title no <laughs> What's the title? The title is Turn Around and Dance With Me. Mm. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I thought you were going to say that. That's a great title. Great. Oh, okay. I guess I got my direction. In I fact, that. I just got asked what song to play out uh, at the end of my show, and I, I, um, used, I did a stint as a lounge lizard uh, going <laughs> paying for grad school, and the song that I picked was called Be My Partner, Dance With Me. So wow. that's what's going to go out well, there you go. on today's show. There you go. So I, I did the song part, but you're asking me to write the book part. Yes, I follow direction. <laughs> Carl, These guys are angels. I, they are. I'm just like, I'm like, okay. I'm no, gonna... no two men has had greater impact on my life the last 
12 years when I shifted in consciousness. Neil's book turned me on. Stevie Wonder told me about Michael Beckwith. I, I got a hold of him and he poured into my life. These men are angels and apostles mm. sent from God to my soul right now. I just adore them. Honored to be in their presence. So, I mean, so, so, there, so that's a good segue to the next question. Is there anything that the three of you do not agree on? <laughs> because you keep agreeing with each other. Is there anything that you disagree with? I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably not. We'd have to we'd have to hang out for a while. We probably, you know, everybody has a unique perspective mm -hmm. and and language and the way they would language the infinite. So we might probably say things differently or have a different perspective on something. But I think on the big pictures, the big stuff, mm -hmm. we're probably in alignment. It, it appeared. I mean, I've read uh, uh, Neil's book. I've hung out with Carlton and um, hung out with Neil. Neil spoke at my Revelation conference. He's been on my radio program. So is so Carlton. So I think on the big picture items, we're probably totally in alignment. There might be some perspectives that we would see differently. And, that's, mm -hmm. and that, of course... Uh, is necessary because if we were all the same person, one of two of us wouldn't need to exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one the one small disagreement we might have with is is on a neck bone because Michael doesn't eat neck bones. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta eat one every once in a while. <laughs> he, he he doesn't eat any bone. <laughs> he eats pl unless plants have but, bones. But we all agree at <laughs> <in> eating food. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Big perspective. We all eat. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So um, before I give you your uh, your award, what is your one wish that you would have on uh, for for the planet, like in, in in your lifetime, what is one thing that you would hope to see that you're that you're beginning to see or that you haven't seen? What is one hope or wish that you would have? Uh, let's start with uh, Neil. That the world would change its mind about God. I wrote a book called God's Message to the World. You got me all wrong, and I can tell you now that. My one wish is that the world would change its mind about God. I think that would solve so much, more than one could possibly imagine, because so much of what we are seeing now on the planet, the behaviors that we see being expressed and so forth, are um, emerging from our present understanding and our, our present thoughts about mm -hmm. God. So my one wish is that the world would change its mind about God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Carlton? Yeah. Well, I, well I, very much what Neil's thinking, I would have used the term divine accuracy. If we could be more exactly, precisely, and accurately divine, the world would have no issues or none like it does now. Mm -hmm. we, have, we, are, we have lost or, or, or we have forgotten our divinity mm -hmm. and mislaid or misplaced it and sometimes replaced it with this aberration. So I agree with that. And when we can get to divine accuracy, that would bring immediate calm and peace on the planet mm, beautiful big brother you get the last word i embrace exactly what they're saying and and what i know for sure when we look out upon the world every issue that we're facing has a solution and uh as we i would just if i had a wish i and i think we're all working on this that people wake up to mm -hmm. the, the the solutions that are already here whether it be uh poverty or lack, that doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. It's a concept of shortage, lack, limitation. It does, it's not real. It's an illusion. The energy is uh, not being created or destroyed throughout the entire cosmos. There's more than enough for everyone on the planet. Uh, Neil mentioned this earlier about the fact that the issues we're facing are, are human-made, mainly man-made. You look at tornadoes, and they are the expression of the equator trying to cool itself off as, mm. we've, as we're heating up the world. The, the hotter the equator gets, the more tornadoes and, and, and hurricanes you have. So I think as we wake up uh, to the truth that for every issue that we see, there's already a solution. Some are being inhibited by greed and some are being inhibited by ignorance. And so I want us to, to wake up mm. to the solutions. And so I, I would say that we're all very optimistic. And that means that and an optimist is not someone who 
runs away from a problem or pretends it's not there. An optimist is simply a person that knows that behind every problem, there's an answer mm -hmm. and there's yeah. a solution. Mm -hmm. A pessimist is someone that believes that there's no answers or things are always going to be the way they are. And I would say that we're optimistic because we know that there's an answer, there's a solution, and I want people to wake up to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And my wish is that uh, all the people who are listening now uh, feel and know how loving, loved, and lovable, how worthy and good enough they are, and that the God that I share with all three of these fabulous men on the panel is one that wraps you in a warm blanket of worthiness. And with that, I wanted to um, sure. just thank and present all three of you with Dr. Marissa's Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> guess where I got that from, Rev. <laughs> but That's I and beautiful. I thank you, and I don't give no it to everybody. Award. I'm sorry. No greater award than that. Exactly, at least on my show. Thank you so, so much. Um, is there anyone that you would want to come back on the air and talk to that isn't on this panel right now? Besides the Dalai Lama, who I would like to have on the show. That's <laughs> just curious. Gene Houston. Gene Houston, okay. Have you had Gene? No. I dreamt about her last night, Neil. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. Okay. She's in a dream so, of mine, along with Maladoma Somme and, and some others. But Jean was in my dream okay. last two nights. So that's right. interesting that you bring, bring her name up. Yeah, I think Jean, Jean, Jean has, a, has a mind that should it's probably a national treasure okay. <laughs> in terms of the global right. really so, treasure. So, so we'll have you, if I can get Jean, I'll tell Jean that you, she's been asked for, and we'll have another panel and, and continue this and give you more time, Neil, to answer all of my difficult have you ever had Have you ever had Sue Mortar on your program? No. No, had I've had Marianne Williamson, and I've had Don Miguel. I'm, Don Miguel's coming back again. I'm on location, actually, in a couple of weeks at The Conscious Life, and he's getting a lifetime achievement. So he's coming on again, and his son. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, Sue Mortar has a tremendous brilliance and articulation and okay. tremendous embodiment of this energy that we're talking about. Okay. I will, I will ask her. And since they call me the Asian Oprah because of all of my Oprah guests, I guess Oprah would be a good one to come back and, and have a conversation with all the three of you, too. Why not? <laughs> I'd love Rob Bell. He's a dear friend. Okay. All right. Thank you for, for again, giving me nothing to do this year, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you so much again for joining me on the show. Thanks for celebrating my 200th show. And peace and blessings. And love, love, love you, all three of you, so very much. So grateful. Peace and blessings. Dr. Marissa, appreciate you. Appreciate <laughs> Neil and Carlton, and uh, keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, it's going to take me uh, another 200 shows to get over that one. <laughs> that was so amazing. I am like, okay. I'm not going to sleep for a week. I'm going to be playing that one over and over. I usually don't like playing shows over because I've got that perfectionistic voice going on and I don't want to do it, but but I definitely will. It's so much wisdom, so much wisdom. And it's at the end of the show, and before I run out of time, it is time for the balance bar. And that's when I invite you to balance more with me and uh, uh, join me in the things that are going on with respect to uh, Dr. Marissa and uh, balance. So the 21 day fast for complaining, the balance tip for today, day two on the round 56 is never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. Yesterday was easy. If you complained, you started over at day one all day, but now every complaint will cost you and go back to day one. So don't forget to register for the fast two at the number four balance.org. And if you get all 21 days in a row, as Edwin Gaines says, you'll gain spiritual transcendence, but you'll also get a motivational card pack from me, 52 card pick me up, stacking the deck for life balance with Dr. Marissa. Also save $300. This is your Asian Oprah giveaway an extra $50 off the balance retreat in the beautiful vortexes of Sedona. And as I mentioned to my big brother, I will be on the 
location at the Conscious Life Expo at the LAX Hilton, I believe. Um, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, who is receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award with his son. And thank you so much at my 200th show for um, thank uh, all, the, all the people that support me, uh, Jarvis, Tony, um, and on my KCAA channel, it is Mark and Fred and Joe and Mike. So thanks. There's a lot of men in my life. A um, lot of good men in my life. So thank you so much. Uh, and I wanted to say that next week, Dr. Pat Allen. Uh, she's been on Oprah four times. She's going to be on Asian Oprah five times. Now, uh, she, uh, Oprah calls her the comic mother superior. Uh, Michael, you actually did a forward on one of her books. She will. Uh, uh, she told me uh, she will be on again, raking me through the romance coals. She tells me every year everything that I'm doing wrong. But just to prove that I am following her advice, if you're single and if you follow Fran Drescher, who was my past guest uh, in my first year, Five S's. If you're single, sexy, successful, and um, smart and straight, then you can qualify to be one of the three bachelors on my show uh, called The Dating Game. No, no. It's called The Waiting Game, formerly known as The Dating Game. So I'm going to be blindfolded, so I cannot choose you with my eyes. I have to use my ears, as she's always telling me. So that's February 16th. You have to be present to win and play. Ha, ha, ha. So contact Jarvis Essex, my uh, producer, on either Facebook or at fourbalance.org, and we will have some fun for valentine's and that's it for today tune in next week for another fabulous episode with dr pat allen celebrating valentine's day otherwise known as single awareness day on take my advice i'm not using it get balanced with dr marissa pay that's p for positive ei and remember it's all about balance peace in and peace out But the illusion didn't last a 